today's topic is thermal physics. <laughs> Okay, so what I, what I told these three actually is that each time I'm going to cover a topic that is not covered in the curriculum, that is on the AP exam, uh, sorry, SAT2 exam. And so I'm covering things you haven't learned yet. Well, in this case, you have learned them some, okay, because you learned something about them in chemistry. Okay, so thermal physics means that we're talking about temperature, which unfortunately has the same symbol as period and tension and <laughs> so, anyway, so temperature is a capital T and you learned in chemistry that temperature has to do with the motion of the molecules, right? And the higher the temperature, the faster the molecules moved. For a gas, right? Yep, so you had that the average kinetic energy, the kinetic energy of the molecule was 3 halves kT, where k is Boltzmann's constant, which is always on a reference table. Okay? You usually don't have to really worry about Boltzmann's constant because most of the questions that it talks about on things like the SAT2 have to do with things like, if you double the temperature, what happens to the kinetic energy? So if you double the temperature, the kinetic energy doubles, the molecule doubles. Okay, now, since you know physics now, you know that kinetic energy is at 1 half mv squared, so that's 3 halves kT. And therefore, the, what is called root mean square, that's what that RMS stands for, um, square velocity is going to be 3kT over m, where this is the mass of the molecule or atom, and we square root. Okay, root mean square is a way of dealing with the fact that the molecules are going in all directions. So if you take the average of something that's going in all directions, you would get an average velocity of zero. So what you do is you square it to take out the direction, and then you square root it to get it back to being velocity, and that's where root mean square comes from. Okay. So again, this tells you that if you double the temperature, your root mean square velocity would increase by a factor of the square root of two. Right? Okay. So, and in chemistry, you also learned that as you increase the temperature of an object. Actually, let's see. I think you did it in terms of heating. Heat in versus temperature. As you increase the temperature of an object by putting in heat, right? As you increase the temperature of an object by putting in heat, you come to a point where, if you're doing it with a solid, the solid begins to melt, right? The solid begins to melt, so it's melting. And then you keep putting in heat, and it is now all melted, so the temperature of the liquid begins to rise until it reaches the boiling point and then you have it evaporating and when it's all evaporated then the temperature rises again. So this is a graph that you should have seen in chemistry. 
Okay, where this is the solid, <laughs> this is liquid, and this is gas. And the amount of heat required to melt, this is something you learned in chemistry, the amount of heat in that is required to melt is given by the mass of your object times the heat of fusion. Okay, so that if something is changing from a solid to a liquid, then you are putting in heat, the object is gaining heat. If something goes from a liquid to a solid, it is going to be losing heat, so the surroundings will be gaining heat. Right? Okay. So you learned that the amount of heat in to melt is given by the mass times the heat of fusion. Right? This is heat of fusion. So this is to melt. The amount of heat in to evaporate. Okay, give me a minute. Is given by the heat of vaporization. putting into the system. But the temperature does increase it stays the same. Temperature does not increase while it is evaporating. While it only starts to because the the heat is going into the energy mm -hmm. is going into the breaking of the bonds mm -hmm. rather than into increasing the motion. Oh, okay. Okay. okay? So yes, temperature does not increase while it's melting, while it's evaporating. But when it's not. But once it has all eva melted, if you put in more heat, then the temperature starts oh, okay. to rise again. So this would be a solid liquid mixture, and this would be a liquid gas mixture. Okay. For the regions where, so for the solid, liquid, and gas, the heat required to raise the temperature is given by MCAT. And there would be different uh, specific heats for the different phases. So it would be different for solid, liquid, and gas. And in a typical problem, they would give it to you. Okay? So, so that in a typical problem, they would give you the mass and the heat of fusion, or, or maybe they would ask you to interpret a diagram. Notice that talking about slopes, since we've been doing a lot of talking about slopes, the heat in over the change in temperature, right? So if you did the slope of the line, actually in this case, if we're doing temperature versus heat in, we would do change in temperature over heat in is going to be one over coefficient. So, so you could use the slope of the line to figure out what the specific heat is. Or you could just me measure the change in temperature, look at the values for the heat. So let me, let me just do one. 
What does C stand for? C is specific heat. Uh, I think you called it something else in chemistry. You yeah. called it I think it's specific heat. Heat capacity? No, specific heat? It's specific heat. Yeah. Okay. Specific heat. Okay, so just suppose that we're gonna make a really simple problem. Let's say that here we're at 10 joules, and here we're at 30 joules. And supposing that this temperature is 50 degrees Celsius, and let's suppose these are not very reasonable numbers. This is 100 degrees Celsius. Then for a one kilogram mass, we could figure out that the specific heat, which would be our heat in divided by the mass times the change in temperature, would be our heat in, which is the 30 minus the 10, over our mass, which is one kilogram, times the difference in temperature, which is 100 minus 50, okay? So 50 degrees. Okay, so that's how you can figure out the specific heat from the graph. Which reminds me that I should really have talked about temperature in the different units up here, right? Because we've been using degrees Celsius. Uh, there's also degrees Kelvin. Do you remember the conversion between Celsius and Kelvin? And degrees Celsius is the temperature in Kelvin. So 300 degrees Kelvin is approximately room temperature of 20 degrees C, right? Okay. So how can we get this heat in? There are several different ways. So let's just erase this. So this is quick review. Convection, conduction, radiation. Convection, there aren't any good mathematical models for. Conduction depends on the gradient in temperature. The bigger the gradient in temperature, that is, if it's 10 degrees in here and it's 80 degrees out there, then there's going to be a lot of heat flow from there to here. If it were 80 degrees in here and 80 degrees out there, then there would be very little heat flow by conduction. Radiation is when um, it it's what it sounds like. It radiates away. It goes as T to the fourth power. That's pretty much what you have to know about convection, conduction, radiation. Convection is when the air, for example, is moving, so the air moving takes away some of the heat. Conduction is just uh, across a barrier, typically, and radiation is the kind of cooling that we get on nice, clear days when everything is really calm, right? So it can radiate out towards space. Okay, once you've gotten a change in temperature, let's look at the effect of a change in temperature on, in particular, solids and gases. 
Let's do gases first because you know how it works. In gases, you learned the ideal gas law, which was that pressure times volume was nRT, or sometimes it's written pressure times volume is mkT. It doesn't really matter. The main thing is that pressure, volume, over temperature is a constant for a closed system. That is, you don't have mass coming in or out. Okay, so therefore you would get questions like if pressure doubled and the temperature tripled, what happens to your volume? And for that sort of thing, you would do, okay, the original pressure volume over temperature is equal to the final pressure volume over temperature. And therefore, the final volume would be 3 halves, when we cross multiply, the, board the original three volume. To the main office. Right, the pressure is canceled, the temperature is canceled. So we have that the final volume, this is our final volume, sorry. Our final volume is 3 halves the initial volume. And that's the kind of typical problem you would get where you're looking at the effect of a change in pressure or a change in temperature on the volume or a change in the volume and temperature on the pressure and so on. Okay, good. Okay, on solids, the main effect on a solid is that it expands slightly so that the length of a solid is the original length times some coefficient, which they'd have to give to you, times the change in temperature. And similarly, volume is approximately, all you have to do is multiply by 3, multiply your coefficient really by 3 in order to get the volume change. So it is also proportional to the change in temperature. So you might get something like um, if the the length of a bar of iron increases by 5% by how much does the width of the bar of iron increase? And the answer would be five percent, because if this increases by five percent, then the width is basically the same formula, right? It's just a different dimension. So if it's five percent of the length, it's going to be five percent of the width. So those are the main effects of temperature on gases and solids, on uh, materials that you need to worry about. And then we get to the laws of thermodynamics. That is when you have heat flowing from one place to another in order to do work. Okay, we have three laws of thermodynamics. The first law basically says that you can measure temperature because an object that is in thermal equilibrium with another object, if that object is in thermal equilibrium in the next object, then the first one is in equilibrium with the first one. 
So if A is in equilibrium with B, and B is in thermal e equilibrium with C, then A and B and C are in equilibrium, thermal equilibrium. I'm talking about thermal equilibrium here. Okay, so that means that you can actually measure temperature, is really what that's called. And the second law of thermodynamics is something that should look a little familiar to you because we've been using work equals change in kinetic, plus change in potential, plus this change in, except it's not really internal energy, it's, it's, it's not really Q, it's U. Q stands for heat flow in every other place except the region's reference table. So you can, this is telling you, this isn't actually the, the first, the second law yet. This is telling you that work can produce a change in internal energy. From chemistry, you know that heat can produce a change in internal energy. So the first, the second law of thermodynamics simply tells you that heat and work both can cause a change in internal energy. A change in internal energy manifests itself in terms of a change in phase or a change in temperature, right? So if you've got, this would be heat into the system. When we write it this way, this is one way of writing the second law of thermodynamics. When we write it this way, this is the work done on the system. Usually when you're talking about thermodynamics, you're trying to figure out how you can heat something and get work done. So the way it's usually written is as a negative work done by the system. Yes? Um, since the heat would be in units of temperature and degrees? No, heat is in units of joules. Oh, okay. Right, when I had my, my heat axis here, and I gave my example, heat is okay. in units of joules. Okay. This and then this has temperature units, but then you have the m, the mass times the specific heat, which together gives you units of joules. So it's all in joules. Okay. So heat is in joules. Okay. So this is work on the system. Work on the system is just the negative of work by the system. Work done by the system. Because usually in machines, you're putting heat in like a steam engine, you're putting heat in, and you're getting mechanical work out. So you're really interested in work being done by the system. Okay, so this is the second law of thermodynamics, and you would use it, for example, in, uh, they would have to give you two of the three variables. That is, if you put in, okay, let's, I'll write it out. In 300 joules of heat and 200 joules of work is done by the system. What is the change in internal energy? And so this one would be pretty straightforward. You have 300 joules of heat in, so that's in, so it's positive, and work done by the system, 
That's going out of the system, so we're going to make that negative is equal to the change in our internal energy. So the change in the internal energy would be 100 joules in this case. The other application that is sometimes done is if it says that it is in a cycle, so it returns to the same temperature. If it returns to the same temperature, there is no change in internal energy, so the work in would be equal to the heat done by in that particular case. Okay. So that's the second law of thermodynamics. And then the third law of thermodynamics is basically that entropy increases. I'm going to keep it simple. There's a formula for it, but we don't really need it. Entropy always increases, disorder always increases. And so, that's in a nutshell. Oh, no, I forgot one. We need to know about efficiency. Okay, efficiency. Let me just, that's up here with the. Third law, you need to know that the efficiency is basically the amount of work that comes out for the amount of heat that goes in. So the work out would be the difference in the amount of heat that goes in from the amount of heat that goes out over the heat in. And it's usually expressed in a percent. I'm going to get rid of entropy increases so I can do an example. So, for example, suppose you had an efficiency of 20%, and you know that you put in 400 joules of heat. You could figure out how much heat came out. So, your efficiency, 20%, okay, we have to make that into a number instead of using percent, right? So your efficiency would be the heat in, which is 400 joules, minus your heat out, over the heat in, and therefore you could solve for the amount of heat that comes out. Okay, so that's thermal physics in a nutshell. Pretty good, covered it in half an hour. Um, so...